Some say madman, some say king. Wonder working rebel priest. Jesus Christ the Nazarene. He knew well what it would take. Free us all from sin and grave. Perfect man would have to die. And only he could pay that price. Friday's good cause Sunday's coming. Don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming. Devil, you're done, you better stop running. Those soldiers take him in as his friend betrayed him with a kiss. And there before the mighty crowd, like a lamb to the slaughter, didn't make a sound. Then he carried that. He shed his blood to set us free as the nails went in and the sky grew dark the redemption of the world was on his heart friday's good cause sunday is coming don't lose hope cause sunday The Son of God and man was dead with bloody hands, tears on their face. They laid him down. Happy Easter, MCC family. He is risen. Amen.
Oh, it's so awesome to worship with you here on campus and online this morning. We're so thankful that you chose to make this a part of your Easter celebration. Two things for you this morning as we get ready to continue in worship. One, if you're new with us, we have a gift for you in the lobby. No strings attached. Just walk on out there. Find one of our First Impression team members. They'll be happy to make sure that gets to you. And two, if you've not yet downloaded the Version Bible app, please do so. And if you go to the More section and click Events, you will find MCC listed there, and you can follow along with the sermon notes today in the message. Other than that, we're going to continue our time worshiping together, so let's stay standing and continue to give God the glory. Amen. amen. All right, let's celebrate this morning our risen Savior as we sing what we believe. chorus again this morning as we sing what we proclaim will never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Sing that again. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away Son, all praise to 
Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad, amen? So that, that passage is from Psalm 118 and it is referenced time and time again throughout the New Testament. And it always points back to this passage as a fulfillment of prophecy. Way back when, they were talking about, this, the, the author was talking about Jesus, this promised Messiah, the stone the builders rejected that became the cornerstone. And we sing because we know and we can look back and we see what happened. Though he was despised, though he was rejected, though he was beaten and crucified and killed, for doing nothing wrong. God had a plan for Jesus. And that Friday, like we just sang, that Friday was good because Sunday was coming. Amen. Because that tomb would be empty on the third day gave so much purpose to that, what seemed like a senseless death. And so when it says the, the cornerstone, in, in a building, the cornerstone is that first foundation stone that's laid that sets the direction for the rest of the building. God had the plan through Jesus for all of us, for all of mankind. And so when we sing this morning, and we will sing of our cornerstone, the foundation on which our life is built, who sets the direction and the course for our lives, that's why we sing of that this morning. And so let's celebrate and thank God for the gift of Jesus, our cornerstone. Let's sing this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and say. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. It is in Christ alone, cornerstone. Christ alone.
come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For us to stand before the throne. Well, hey, thanks for being here. I'm glad that you're sharing your Easter Sunday with us. Listen, Easter Sunday is one of those days it is celebrated not just around the world. It's been being celebrated now for hours and hours and hours around the world. Uh, I love this. H.G. Wells said this. It's in the notes in the Uversion Bible app. He said, I'm a historian. I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. And the Easter story has influenced people now for thousands of years, and it still does today, even, even children. So one of our kids years ago, he had invited his friend with him to church. They were out in the lobby area, and this shovel used to hang out there. It had a really nice case. It was from when we initially built this part of the building, and he had taken his buddy over there. This was for our 50th anniversary. By the way, we're celebrating 70 years this year, uh, but it was used in the groundbreaking... Si well, thank you. <laughs> this, this was used in the groundbreaking ceremony for this part of the building, but he took his buddy over to where it was hanging on the wall, and he said, you see that shovel right there? That's the shovel they used to bury Jesus. And I, I thought, to be, to be clear, it's not. Uh, but the two, listen, the two biggest holidays of the year, especially in the church world, but right in general, we know are Christmas and Easter, right? The question is, do you know why it is? What's the draw? You ready? Christmas and Easter are at the very heart uh, of the stories where we get our greatest hope. And we also find out something about who God is, and we find out something about who he says we are also. So again, thanks for being with us. My name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, appreciate you being here on campus. I appreciate those of you who are joining us online this morning. A big shout out to Grandma Phyllis, who's joining us, and as well as Danny and his mom, Yvonne. Thanks for being with us this morning for Easter. Appreciate that. Uh, hey, next week, I'm going to let you know, a little plug for next week, we're starting a series uh, where we're going to be looking at some things going on in our, uh, in our world. We're going to talk about politics and sex and money and culture. And we're calling the series Ick. Uh, because we know, right? We all know that when those things come up, we kind of get the ick about the whole thing. And so we thought we'd just take the most uncomfortable things we could think of and invite you to join us in the conversation. So I hope you'll come. Uh, today we're in Philippians 2. Not, not a traditional Easter 
uh, passage, but these verses are going to tell us something, again, about who God is and about who we are in his eyes. So they're on the YouVersion app. They'll also be on the screen. Check this out. Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, uh, uh, but... Uh, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So I just want to verse 6 one more time. Uh, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The message version, when it talks about verse 6, says, though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. You know, I think one of the reasons that people are drawn to the Easter story specifically is because of what those words actually mean. They, they mean that Jesus, what it talks about what he gave up to go to the cross for our sins. Uh, Easter reminds me that God is bigger, this idea of the divine. God is way bigger than I can imagine. You know, when Matthew talks about the day that Jesus was crucified, he says this, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in this loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing nearby heard him say that, they thought he was calling for Elijah. And so they ran and they, they got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and they offered it up to Jesus to drink. And the rest of them said, now let's leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And then Jesus cried out once more in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Verse 45 says it was from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. If you understand the Jewish system of counting time, Jesus was nailed to the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. It's now the sixth hour, which is noon. So it's when the sun should have been brightest in the sky and darkness fell over the whole land for three hours. That expression, by the way, over the land, the whole land, can mean over all of Judea or it can mean over the whole, the entire earth. Luke tells us in his gospel that the sun stopped shining. D Douglas Webster, so I put this in the notes, said, at the birth of the Son of God, there was brightness at midnight. At the death of the Son of God, there was darkness at noon. Hey, in case you haven't heard, we are expecting a total eclipse of the sun on April 8th. It is going to last, as first, it's the only one for the next 20 years, but it's going to last, and we're right in the path of it. It is going to last two minutes and 45 seconds. So don't miss that. Uh, estimates of over a half a million people coming into the Dayton area uh, to see it, clogging roads and all that kind of stuff. Can you imagine? I say that because we're kind of anticipating that. Can you imagine if all of a sudden at noon one day, it just went dark and we, we were not expecting it and it was dark for three hours. Verse 51 says the earth shook so hard that the rock split. An earthquake powerful enough to split rocks would be a significant tremor. They were used to uh, earthquakes in that part of Judea. A quake within a force, though, to split rocks would have brought the whole city to a standstill for several minutes because the Jews believed that earthquakes were connected to God. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament when Moses was met with God on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. We read that the mountain trembled violently. I tell you that because I want to make sure you understand God's not a wuss. Uh, he is, he's ferocious. And what I wonder is if God didn't grab the world in his hands and just give it a shake like that, and his hand happened to be over the land. And so it became dark. You know, when Isaiah talks about how powerful God is, he writes, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on the scale? So if you wonder how big God is when we talk about how big he is, there are 370 quintillion gallons uh, of water. That's this number right here on the screen. And God holds that in, in his hands, right? The earth weighs 13 sextillion, 170 septillion pounds. And I realize it sounds like I'm making up words there. But uh, that, that's, so that's what that looks like in numbers to which God responds yeah, that feels, that feels about right, I'd say, you know. Uh, and not to belabor the point, but God said this, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? 
Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He brings out the starry host one by one and calls each one of them by name. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Now, I just want to show you what all of that means. This is uh, our galaxy. Does anybody know the name of our galaxy? Thank you. Took the first hour a couple guesses to get that one right. Uh, The Milky Way. To be clear, there is no one picture of the Milky Way galaxy. It requires several telescopes, some in the ground, some up in space, uh, taking a series of pictures from different directions. Uh, But just last year, the James James Webb Telescope was able to see its center, the center of our galaxy. It's the heart of the the cluster is a massive star still in formation. Its mass is 30 times that of our sun. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. It's so fast. It travels around the earth seven times in a second. So a light year is 186,000 miles per second for a year. And I know that some of you are already trying to work that math out in your head. I can see the smoke. Uh, But just to let you off the hook, that's 5.88 trillion miles in a year. And NASA says that our galaxy is 100,000 of those. Our sun is a raging ball of fire. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. It's like 10 billion hydrogen bombs going off every second. I read this week that the power generated by the sun in a single second is equivalent to 6 billion years of continuous consumption of energy by our whole planet. Uh, Unless, of course, we're all driving electric cars, which case it'll go down a little bit. Uh, And that's just, listen, it's just one of billions of stars in the Milky Way, which is just one of hundreds of billions of stars uh, of galaxies in the known universe that God has made. The James Webb Telescope has also given us new images of like this. This is Pleiades, 440 light, million light years uh, away, excuse me, 440 light years away, or the Cartwheel Galaxy, which is 489.2 million light years. 8,154 light years out is the Hourglass Nebula, which I don't know what you think. It's just like God is showing off at this point. But the, the thing that you see in the middle is a star that's dying. And when, my, when I was little, my mom would tell me, you better be good because God is watching you. And it turns out she may have been right. Uh, and if you can't see with the Hourglass Nebula... Maybe he's looking at you through the Helix Nebula. Listen, there's a lot of options for him to see us. 31 million light years is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's been called one of astrology's galactic darlings. And I think part of it's those little pink lights. They make it look so pretty, right? Those are ferocious star-forming incubators. Scientists tell us that every second a star is born in our universe And Isaiah said this, who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? So if this is the Milky Way galaxy over here, 31 million times 5.88 million miles for God on his hand is probably about right there is my guess. Listen, the Bible says that there wasn't anything made that Jesus didn't make. And then it says, the Son, talking about Jesus, is the invisible image of God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So all of those things that we just saw, he's holding them all together. He's huge. He's massive. He's ginormous. He's bigger than I could, I could even imagine. And it, may, and it may sound like he's just too big to notice something as small as us, which is why, and I think this is one of the reasons Easter is, just pulls us in, is reminds us that not only is he bigger than we can imagine, but he loves me more than I could ever hope that he would. That's why Philippians 2, verse 7 says this, Rather, uh, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. The Bible says that God loves us so much that he would send his son. I don't know if you've ever noticed when something is on your mind so much that it influences everything that you're thinking that's going on in your life, uh, so much that it seems to consume you, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. 
It could be looking forward to this fall and the football season and the thought of Ohio State going all the way again, you know. The, but maybe for most of us, it was when you started dating, right? Can you remember, do you remember having someone who was always on your mind or in your thoughts? I just want to get you thinking about because that's how God is with you. In his book, Intense Moments with the Savior, Ken Geyer would write, if only Jesus could save himself and us. But Jesus knows something that the man hanging next to him doesn't. He knows he can choose one or the other. He can save himself or he can save us. But he can't save both. So he chooses us. Louis Giglio said, long before you ever met a, made a mess of your life, Jesus made a mess of his. Our mess, our sin, that's exactly what the cross is all about. That's why you read things like what Jesus said, greater love has no one than this. And he would lay down his life for his friends. You want to know what, what Easter has to do with who you are? The cross says, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? I want you to note those words, if God is for us, because it sounds like a question, but it's not. It's not a question. God is for you. And I don't know what your house was like when you were growing up. Maybe your parents forgot you or turned their back on you. Maybe your teachers neglected you growing up. Maybe your spouse has walked out on you or your siblings are ashamed of you. But I want to let me make sure you know God, your father, he's for you. Not maybe, not has been, not was, not would be. He is. And if he had a calendar, your birthday would be circled. But I have a feeling all of the days would be circled on his calendar, right? If he drove a car, can you imagine the bumper sticker, I'm the proud father of, blah, 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 blah. Uh, If there's a tree in heaven, it's got no bark left on it because he's carved all of our names in it. Here's what I think is interesting. We know he has a tattoo, and we know what it says. It says, see, I've written your name on the palms of my hand. That's what, that's what you mean to him. God says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? You know, when I was growing up, I was told there are no dumb questions, but I got to tell you, that is, you know, can you imagine, moms, can you imagine feeding your infant and five minutes later going, what was, what was that kid's name again? I mean, you, you stroke their hair, you touch their face, you sing their name over and over again. Can a mom forget? There's no way in the world. But God says, even if she could, and we all know she's not going to. But even if she could, I wouldn't. Now, author Marianne Bird shared a personal story in what she called the whisper test. She wrote, I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates made it very well known how I looked to others. I was the little girl with the misshapen lip and the crooked nose and the lopsided teeth and the garbled speech. And so when they would ask me what happened to me, I would tell them that I had an accident and cut my lip on a, on a piece of glass because somehow it seemed more acceptable that it had been caused by an accident rather than having been born differently. And I was convinced because of the way people treated me that nobody outside of my family could ever love me. She said that was, however, until a teacher in the second grade that we all adored, Mrs. Leonard was her name. She said she was short and round and happy and annually, we would have a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the hearing test to everyone in the classroom, and finally it was my turn. And if you're old enough, you remember these days where you would have to stand with your, right next to the door with an ear and cover an ear, and then the teacher would whisper something from their desk that you had to repeat, something very simple like the sky is blue or do you have new shoes. And she said, I waited there for her to ask the question, but instead she made a statement that God must have put uh, into her mouth. They were seven words that changed my life. She said, Mrs. Leonard whispered to me, I wish you were my little girl. So you know what God whispers from Easter? If you'll just believe, you're my child. You're my friend. I am with you. God says, you are the one I sing over. You are the one I'll never forget. You are the one whose name is tattooed on my hand. I love you. You might have scars of rejection from your past, trauma from those who are supposed to have loved you, or unreconciled relationships that make it easy to forget that you are loved 
beyond measure by a Father in heaven. Listen, God, God's love reminds us that our brokenness does not define us. His unconditional love does. And God loves you as his own, not your past hurts or rejections. You are his and you are loved beyond measure. And he doesn't just say it once and hope that you catch it on the side. He says it over and over and over again. You're the one that I love. You're the one that I love. That's who you are. So here's the thing about Easter. When we think of Easter, we usually think of a cross. But I want to make sure that you catch also, it's a crossroad. It's not just a cross, it's actually a crossroad. It's not a one-way story. This is a story that demands a decision. You believe it or you don't. And my guess is that everyone here this morning, everyone who's joining us online, we all believe it right here. Did this story really happen? Of course it really happened. But here's the deal. Easter is not one of those stories that you can say you believe it and visit God once or twice a year. If God is really bigger than, than we could ever imagine him to be, and if he loves you and me more than we could ever hope, we have to respond to that. That's why Philippians 2 continues in verse 9, Therefore, read that because of Easter, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I just want to be real clear. There are many of us who have already done that. We, every day, we take a knee to our King, and not only with our words, but with our very lives, the way we live our lives. We acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord of our life. Not perfectly, not sinless, not talking about that, but talking about being faithful to who God is to the best of our ability. And if you have not, can I just say that you can? It's not too late for that to happen. I'm going to be up front if you want to talk about what, what that would take. I'd love to talk to you after service. But if you haven't and it's not what you want, can we just call Easter for what it is for you? I mean, it's just about a basket and some eggs. And I realize that's harsh. And I realize that can come across offensively. But I want to make sure you don't fool yourself into thinking that going to church a couple times a year is following Jesus. Sitting in a room for an hour is not following anyone. Following Jesus is a daily decision that requires getting up and living your life in a way that reflects his. A few years ago, I was at the Y, and I noticed a lady with a cross that was tattooed on her chest. It was right here, and I thought to myself, now that is interesting. I've seen crosses tattooed all over the place, hands, arms, legs, thighs. I've seen crosses, all, tattoos all over, but never there. And I happened to bump into her right before I left, and so I said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? So by the way, if you're ever at the Y, and I want to ask you something, I'm going to. Um, she said, no, go ahead. I said, why do you have a cross tattooed right here? And she said, my grandpa prayed the rosary every day, and he had crosses everywhere. And before he died, I did this to honor him. She said, but, but you know that verse, uh, train up a child in the way he should go? She had no idea she was talking to a pastor. I said, and when he is older, he won't depart from it? She said, that's the one. She said, it started out to honor my grandpa, and it still does. But but now it reminds me of who I belong to. That's why I like that it's tattooed over my heart. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's why Christmas and Easter are the most attended Sundays. Really, I mean, really, they are where we get our identity. Christmas reminds us that God sent his son on a rescue mission to save us from our sins. Easter reminds us that the cost of accomplishing that mission came at the life of his son. That that's how valuable we are to him. It cost him his life to accomplish the mission, and they remind us of who we belong to. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, Easter is an annual reminder of the hope that God gives you if, if, if you will give yourself over to him. And each week, our time of communion is a reminder to us. Listen, we celebrate Easter every Sunday here during our time of communion. We hold the emblems that remind us of Jesus' body and the juice that reminds us of his blood that was spilled on the cross. And it's a reminder to us. Every week, we hold a reminder in our hands that no matter how too much you think your past is, no matter how big and you can't get past it and no one would ever forgive you and I just can't believe and why would God ever and I just, there's no way. No matter how much you think your past is too much, he's bigger than your past. And he's more powerful than anything you could have ever said or done. And our communion 
is a reminder that he loves us. And it's our hope that no one else, no one else can give you. But we have to respond to that. And so for those of us who are followers of Jesus, this is our response. Jesus said, when you do this, I just want you to remember. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done. Remember how much I love you. And remember that I've called you to follow me. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to do this together. All right? Father, thank you for, uh, man, just this reminder. I mean, every year we come to Easter and we know it's a special day. And we know there are things that are going to happen today that, that may not happen regularly any other time, any other Sunday. Families will get together. Friends will gather. There'll be a special meal. Kids will play games that they really don't play any other time of year. Sometimes we, we involve baskets and eggs and toys and fun like that. But Father, at the heart of this day and the celebration of it, is how we look at you and what you gave up to save us. And so we, we remember now, Jesus, that you allowed yourself to be brutalized and murdered. You, you left heaven to allow that to happen to you. And you laid your life down. No one took it from you. You gave it up because you knew we could not pay the price for our own sins. Thank you for paying that for us. And we want to remember that. We want to honor that now. And we're grateful for the hope that you give us. It seems enough that you would forgive us our past, to give us hope for our future. It's almost too much for some to believe. But God, help us to hold on to that as well. And so we come to you now as we remember together who you are, who we belong to, if we will just trust you. And Jesus, thank you. We love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. And so we take the bread that reminds us of his body that he gave up for us. No one took it. He gave it freely so that our sins might be forgiven and we remember together. The juice reminds us of his blood that didn't just, doesn't just cover your sins from the past. I want to make sure you understand. Jesus knows we'll continue to struggle for the rest of our life with sin. And his blood covers that as well. There's not anything you've ever done or anything you'll ever do that will stop him from loving you and his blood from covering your sins. And so we remember. Father, again, thank you. And we know that this is one of those moments that we dreadfully look forward to because we know that we need to be come clean with you. We need to be honest with you about who we've been. And there have been times during this week, perhaps, that we have honored you and helped people see you by the way we live our lives. But we also know that there have been moments when we failed miserably. And sometimes we didn't even try. We just walked right into it. And we need to confess that to you now. And we need to honor you with authenticity. That's what relationships are built on. And so we want to honor you with that even now. And so I'm just going to ask you if you would take a moment to complete that prayer, talking to God with where you are with him, where you want to be, and just appreciating him for what he's done as we celebrate Easter today.
Let's stand together as we respond and worship this morning.
Thank you for choosing to make MCC a part of your Easter experience. I just want to remind you that if you're new with us, we have a gift for you in the lobby. We would love for you to take that or download the Church Center app and click MCC as the church and make sure you know everything and anything happening in the life of our church. It's a great way to get plugged in and get connected. And then for those of you who call MCC your home, just a reminder that the black boxes are around the room for you to have an opportunity to give uh, as an act of obedience and a continuation of your worship. Friends, as we leave this place, let us go in the reminder that Christ is Lord and he has risen and defeated death and conquered the grave. And to celebrate that, let's sing one more song together. We got time for one more. Let's, let's celebrate as we leave today, all right? Citizen of 